We are particularly interested in S. aureus because it can develop a resistance to the antibiotic methicillin, making S. aureus difficult to treat. You have probably heard of the infection Mercer. That is just methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which has harmed both health of humans and livestock. So if S. aureus can infect both humans and livestock, and if S. aureus can develop a resistance to antibiotics, that is the link between the health of cattle and humans we need to be aware of. This video provides a virtual tour of how Dr. Machi and Dr. Gustafsson at Oklahoma State University answered that question. And to do that, they first went out to a dairy. This is step one of the process. They went to a dairy farm and they collected 133 different milk samples from 133 different cattle. Now 33 of those cows were sick, so there was a good chance that there would be some bacteria in some of these milk samples. But remember, they're not, they're not interested in all the bacteria. They want to know, is the Staphylococcus aureus, or S. aureus, in the milk, is that the same species that infects humans? Well, to do that, the second step, after you've got the milk sample, was to put the samples in an environment that would encourage the growth of Staph aureus and discourage the growth of the other bacteria. And that setting that I talk about is something we call an auger. And we're going to show you there were two augers that they use, a Bard Parker auger and a mannitol salt auger. We're going to show you how the mannitol salt auger worked. So the first thing they did was they would take a milk sample and they would sterilize all the tools that you're going to use to do this, make sure you don't bring in external bacteria. And they're going to get some of the milk and they're going to put it on a plate. And on this plate is food for bacteria, particularly for Staph aureus, but it also has a very high concentration of salt. So a lot of bacteria would not be able to tolerate it, but Staph aureus can tolerate the high sample. And then we're going to take and we're going to put it in an incubator. And so after a while, they'll take the samples out. Some of those samples have that yellow streak. And when it has that yellow streak, the researchers think that there's a good chance that it contains Staph aureus. But good chance is not enough for scientists. They want to know with almost perfect certainty whether the Staph aureus species was in the milk sample. Once we have a colony of bacteria growing on our auger plates, then there's a good chance that that bacteria might be Staph aureus, but might be is not good enough for scientists. So what we want to do is we want to pull that DNA out of the bacteria and determine if that DNA is the same as the DNA that we know that's in Staph aureus. And specifically, what we're going to do is we want to look inside that bacteria's DNA and see if anywhere in a DNA strand, there's this identical sequence of 534 letters. If that sequence is there, you've got Staph aureus. Well, unfortunately, you can't just look at a strand of DNA under a microscope, and it doesn't just scream out which letter it is. So instead, we use something called PCR. That stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's one of the greatest breakthroughs in science. It's going to make a copy of it and then another copy of that 534 letters, and another copy, and another copy. It's going to take that strand and amplify it millions of times, such that after only a day, you're going to have millions or more of this identical sequence of DNA. And if you do indeed find that, then you have Staph aureus. The ingredients of PCR are this. First, you have to have the DNA of the bacteria, and you extract the DNA from the bacteria using machines like centrifuges. Then you take primers. Primers are kind of like the instructions on what PCR should do. You add the primer to the DNA. Then you add nucleotides to the DNA. Nucleotides are the building blocks of DNA. And then you're going to add polymerase. And the polymerase is what does all the work. And after all those, adding all those ingredients together, if the bacteria is indeed Staph aureus, you're going to have more copies of this 534 letters that you know what to do with. So then the last step is to pull out one of those copies or several copies or more and see 
is it 534 letters long? If it's 534 letters of long, long, you've got Staph aureus, and we found that the species of bacteria that infects humans can also infect dairy cattle. This brief animation will demonstrate how PCR works. You start with a whole DNA and heat it to 203 degrees Fahrenheit, which causes the two sides of the DNA to separate. We now have two entire strands of the DNA. Specially designed primers then locate a specific part of the DNA. The TAC polymerase then attaches to the primers and begins rebuilding the other strand of that DNA from the primer until the end of the strand. After the first cycle, we still have two complete strands of the DNA, but two lopsided strands as well. Heating the DNA and separating them again, our primers and TAC polymerase then set about rebuilding the other side of four DNA strands. After this second cycle, we have our original two whole DNA strands, four lopsided strands, and two small segments of DNA we call the target. These two segments are the DNA segments we want PCR to replicate. The primers were designed such that if this was the S. aureus bacterium, the polymerase would build these target DNA segments. The process then repeats, and now, after the third cycle, we have our two complete DNA strands, six lopsided strands, and eight target strands. If this continues until the 25th cycle, we have our two original complete DNA strands, 50 lopsided strands, and over 67 million target strands. The target strands soon dominate because each cycle adds no full strands, only two lopsided strands, but the number of target strands more than doubles. It doesn't take many cycles before any DNA pulled from the solution is virtually guaranteed to be one of the target strands. Then we use gel electrophoresis. It's a method to measure the length or the number of letters in a DNA segment. We measure the length of DNA by how far an electric current can push it inside of a gel. Here you see me hand the PCR results to the actual scientist who performed this research, Dr. Stephanie Macchi. She is now going to take a DNA segment from the output of the PCR and place it in a gel substance. Then she closes the lid and tells the computer to begin supplying the electric current for a specific amount of time. Once that time is finished, they will remove it from the gel and then they can analyze it in one of two ways. One is to visualize it in a special machine like this one, or you can have a computer take a picture of a gel. The five horizontal lines in the first and last columns are like measuring sticks. They tell you how far a DNA segment of a certain length will travel. For instance, one of the bars might denote the distance of a segment consisting of 534 letters. The horizontal lines in the middle are the DNA segments. Here's a clearer picture. In the second and third columns are horizontal bars indicating the length that two DNA segments travel. The further up the segment goes, the smaller the segment is. When they analyzed the segment they acquired from the PCR and compared it to the measuring sticks on the sides, they concluded that the DNA segment was indeed 534 letters long. That was proof that the bacteria in the milk sample was indeed S. aureus. Finally, we may want to ask whether this S. aureus is resistant to certain antibiotics. The method for testing this is simple. Put antibiotics on the bacteria and see if it kills it. What you see here is a picture of a petri dish that has had a bacteria colony grown all over it. The solid small circles are where researchers added antibiotics. Some, like the one labeled A, has a large kill zone around it, a large dark circle, where the lack of streaks indicates that the bacteria are no longer growing on it. This means that the antibiotic killed a lot of the bacteria, and so the bacteria is not resistant to that antibiotic. However, look at B, with almost no kill zone around the circle. That means the antibiotic was ineffective, and thus the bacteria was resistant to that antibiotic. The field of biochemistry and molecular biology changes fast, 
And in just a few years, researchers will use different tools than those described here. For instance, instead of using PCR and gel electrophoresis, they will just sequence the whole DNA, thereby acquiring not just one segment of the DNA, but the whole thing. Still, what we have learned today is helpful in understanding those new technologies. The Sanger method of sequencing the entire DNA, it uses PCR, for instance. Although the ion torrent technology for DNA sequencing does not use PCR, it does use polymerase. Moreover, understanding PCR is useful for understanding all DNA studies, whatever methods are employed. PCR played a part of beef production when they discovered the gene causing birth defects in one particular red Angus bull. And PCR was one of the tools used to identify the gene for tender beef and cattle. Rice farmers in developing countries now have access to rice seed that will patiently remain in the soil dormant during prolonged floods, sprouting when the waters have receded. After identifying the gene sequence that makes some plants possess this trait, they inserted this sequence into more popular rice plants. It took only four years between the time this gene sequence was identified before it was available to farmers, and PCR deserves some of the praise.